This afternoon, I would like for us to study from God's good word the subject of our perfect example, Jesus. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 wrote these words. For hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for you, leading you an example that ye should follow in his steps. Now regarding this sacred text, one of the great purposes of the Lord's life among men was that he, by his life, might show to every one of us the kind of living which God requires of us. The kind of living which is possible in spite of the wickedness that dwells in this world and predominates in this world. The kind of living which is possible is also something that is a reality. You can live like God says. The kind of living which will then take us to heaven. Or else that song a moment ago was just empty words. And of course heaven is ours after this life is over and this whole material system has come to an end. The Lord, according to the inspired apostle Peter, is our example now, if you look to the word in the original language that's translated example here, you'll see it's not the word tupas. That's the normal word that's used at least most of the time, for example, such as Philippians 3 and verse 17. But it's rather interesting. It's a longer word. It's hupogramos. That's a compound word. You've heard the word in English, grammar. Well, did you hear gramos there? And hupo is simply a preposition. It means under. Well, gramos carries the idea of writing. It's underwriting. Underwriting. The Lord is our underwriting. Now consider just a moment. We don't use these as much as we used to, but I think still everybody old enough to no knows what a stencil is. I hope you do. <laughs> what a stencil is. Uh, and you know that you mark on it, and that's the way you used to transfer things through printing and so on. The letters of our English alphabet, I think we'll remember this. At least some of us will. <laughs> I've used it before. Where you have it at the top, of a green board or marker board, chalk board, whatever. And those usually are just like they ought to be. And sometimes they'll have the line at the top of the word, line at the bottom of the word, and sometimes a line through the middle to show right where this portion of the letters to be in the middle and where the top's to go and bottom. And used to, you used to get tablets that would have that already lined for you. And thus, you would have the perfectly made letters at the top of the page. And then you would try to, as you learned how to print in those days, uh, even later on, something they're beginning not to teach, I understand, and that is cursive. And you would learn how that was supposed to go. Always having the perfect example at the top of the page, and that you were to imitate. Well, think of the Greek alphabet so long ago and a little Greek boy or girl sitting there as many times they, they had their slate and it would be a wax slate and they would have a stylus and they would be able to write into that wax. When the page filled up, they just had to touch it to something hot and they had a brand new page. Didn't do much for saving the page, but nevertheless, you had as many hot irons you had around and that many new pages waiting on you. So interesting that that is what's used here. The idea, that is, of Hupo Gramos, the perfect writing at the top of the page that we go by 
to learn how we do it ourselves. Now, if you look further into this word at what the lexicons and other writings about Greek says, it even gets more interesting. It suggests that if and when the student would do the very best that he or she could to imitate the posted letters, that then the teacher would actually take the child by the hand. Have you mothers or teachers ever done that? And help them to do a better job in writing the letter. And it's out of this background that I want us to study the Lord, our perfect example. Think of the handwriting that's flawless and perfect and is a pattern that's at the top of the blackboard or the notebook paper. And think about, maybe you can remember some when you were young and you were doing your best to try to make those letters. And if you have some of the material that your mama or somebody saved as a cherished part of your littlest hood <laughs> and your first efforts in school, then if you look back on some of those things that may still have their old stars stuck on it for such good effort on your part, put there by the teacher to encourage you, and you look at it and you shake your head and you think from your mature standpoint, wow, what a mess. But when you brought it home from school, you didn't consider it a mess. And it was probably about as good as you could do at that stage of your development. The teacher knew it. Didn't expect out of you, at least shouldn't, what you couldn't do. But there was that effort. Have you ever watched little children when they're at that stage and they're trying to make those whatever letters they are? I want you to look sometimes at the intensity reflected on their faces as they label so hard usually with the pencil that's real big even then their motor nerves aren't developed enough to where they can really work at it some things you know i don't know whether you know this or not children can't do until they've grown up enough to do it maybe come as a revelation to some people but <laughs> that's the reason they have the big pencils or used to in the very young grades um, but they watch their faces and you'll see such intensity, and that old line will be so scraggly, whatever, and they'll be so proud of it when they finished it. I wish we would transfer that over to the flawlessness and perfection of Christ and how we labor to bring our lives into subjection to the teaching of the Bible concerning how we form our characters. And the intensity that honest-hearted, faithful Christians put in to their determined efforts to be as close as they can, as they possibly can, to the handwriting of Christ at the top of the page. Now, let's focus then, in on, then on Christ, His perfection, His flawlessness. And let's look first of all in flawlessness in character. Have you ever tried to sit down and in your own words write out the meaning of the word person? Have you ever tried to sit down and write out in your own words to get out of your mind your concept of the word character? You might find it not to be so easy to define a person, a personhood, or what character is, but I think you'll find that character is the complex of mental and ethical traits marking a person. Character is the complex of mental and ethical traits marking a person. What you are that other people see comes from your character. That makes your personality. Now, I think it's rather interesting that you'll never find the Lord anywhere in the Scriptures. You won't find it. Talking about disagreements over personality. Find it. You say, well, I think it's there. Good. Study it. And show it to me. I can't find it. I don't ever see 
personality being a reason for anything in so far as going to heaven. I do find various personalities, but he still didn't treat them on the basis of personalities. He treated them on the basis of the sins they committed or the truth they obeyed. Some of the things we use say, well, it's just personality difference. What in the world are you talking about? <laughs> what does that mean? I can't find it in the Bible. Would you find it for me? But I do find character, and you know, character is made by my imbibing the truths of Christ and following the perfect example at the top of the page, that Christ may be seen in me. And my personality then is going to reflect faithfulness. may not reflect what some people think is nice and good and wholesome and all that kind of stuff, because each person has their own view of that. But it will reflect your obedience to the truth and your faithfulness in God's will and your determination to do what's right. It'll always do it. Now, if we're going to have a character like the Lord wants and like has to be in order for us to go to heaven, then it will come by our following the example, the perfect pattern of Jesus at the top of the page. Jesus lived as a servant. Listen to what he said by Paul. And if anybody among humans ever was able to put into practice uh, the life of Christ as well as any mortal could, he did. And in Philippians chapter 2 in verse 5, he says, now watch, this is something we can do. Here's a letter from God concerning individual Christian living. It's not a matter of saying, oh, look at that. Wish I could be that way, but I can't. No. He says to the church at Philippi and to every child of God, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Does that sound like that's something you can't do? And I can't do? Sounds like to me it's saying that's what you're supposed to do and you're expected to do, and that's what it means to be faithful. Then notice he talks about Christ, who, being in the form of God, deity has some kind of form. So, well, what is it? I don't know. But the Holy Spirit who inspired Paul said that it did. So he gave up that form. Notice he thought it not robbery, a thing to be held on to, to be equal with God. When it was necessary for deity to do what deity did to save us, and there was no other way for us to be saved, he immediately gave up the form of deity. He didn't cease being deity. He gave up the form of deity. That must be understood. There have been some brethren who read this, or some people and some brethren, who said, well, he gave up his deity. No, he didn't. But he gave up the form of deity. And what did he do? Made himself of no reputation and took upon himself. Well, look here. Another word form comes up. Took on himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Well, that means he took upon the human form. He, deity gave up deity's form, and deity took on human form. That's the way he would become a servant. Maybe we can understand it a little better like this. God doesn't tempt anybody to sin, and he can't be tempted to sin, James says, to do evil. But Jesus was tempted, and Jesus is God. So do you have a contradiction of the Scriptures? No. When he was in the form of deity in heaven, he couldn't be tempted. But it shows you how far he was willing to go to save us. So he left that form, took upon himself the form that we have as humans, tabernacled in the flesh, thus made him subject to what? Everything we're subject to. And one of those things is to be tempted and solicited to sin. How would you like to be in a position where you could not be tempted to sin? M Possible to be tempted to sin. But to help somebody else out, and you're the only one that can do it, you gave up that and became like them. Begins to tap a little further into the wonderful gems of truth in the Bible as to what all God has done for us to save us. It means we, we should love Him with all that we are. Notice in being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient. 
unto death, even the death of the cross. Character. The complex of mental and ethical traits making a person. Jesus left the very form of deity and took on the form of man, of humanity, put himself in the position to be subject to everything we are, thus allowed himself to be tempted. And we see that he was obedient as a humble person to his Father's will. Now think of the handwriting at the top of the page. Does that tell you and me what life's all about for us? That we should be in a state of humility before God and his word and obedient to it at all costs, and that that's the only thing that should ever be on our mind. That's the beginning point. If you're going to write those letters, trying to be like the perfect example at the top of the page. These qualities, then, are imperative. They must be in our lives. We're talking about the qualities of faithfulness. We're talking about following Jesus according to the handwriting at the top of the page. He never thought a wrong thought. He never said a wrong word. He, went, he, he never went to the wrong place. He never performed a wrong act. Uh, you know, he never made an unsound argument. Never made an unsound argument. He never taught a wrong lesson. He made no erroneous assumptions. In other words, he acted on the basis of adequate evidence, credible witnesses. He never had the wrong attitude or mindset or disposition of heart toward any person or anything. He was in no way, to any degree, disobedient to God's will. He never made a false statement. He never falsely accused anybody. And thus, he was perfect. Now, there's your example. He's left us an example. I've had over the years, all the way back to my youth, heard people sort of make light of what's the big deal about living the Christian life. And I just shook my head the time I was a teenager and said, will you go try to live like Christ one whole day? And you tell me it's not a challenge. But that's what we're here for. You see, we're to bring every thought, Paul said, into subjection to Jesus Christ. In his teaching, you will see that he always respects the way God created man. He never tries to abuse that. After all, he's the executor of the Father's will, and he created all things. Without him was not anything created or made, according to John, John 1. So if anybody knew man, the one who put him all together <laughs> knew him and knew how he functioned, knew how he learned. So when he came to be this man to enter into his own creation, then in his conveying of the truth that man needed to know to be saved, he didn't go around man's free moral agency or man's free will. He would plead with people on the grounds of adequate evidence and credible witnesses to do what he should do. He would uh, say, come unto me, all you that labor, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But he never said, I'm going to force you against your will to come to me. It's just not there. He will try to do all he can, and he does, in the pattern of life he, in the flesh that he sets before men and in the teaching to cause them to use, the way we put it, the brains God gave them, to understand, but he never forced them against their will. He would stress the responsibility that each human being has, that is, the accountability to God. Notice in one way or the other, as you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how he does that in various ways, reminding them there's a day coming when you must give an account for what you think, say, and do to God. He would say things like, I always do my Father's will. My meat or my food or my sustenance is to do the Father's will. 
Now, there's a, there's a good point. You know, he talks about people hungering and thirsting after righteousness and those who have that disposition in their mind toward the truth. He says that person will be filled. Maybe that begins to tell us if I don't know much about the Bible, maybe I'm not too hungry for it. Maybe I'm hungering about other things. He emphasizes uh, to man, and he doesn't bypass it, the ability that God has given man to think, to reason, to perceive, to understand, to plan, and to purpose. Yeah, God's put that in our power. And in approaching us with the gospel, or as Christians, in trying to get us to be closer to the Lord in our thoughts, words, and actions, you will see that he will emphasize those things. You can't read anything in the New Testament that will not show that. Every word will somewhere or the other be uh, begging you on the light of the evidence to do what's right while you've got the time to do it. He even knew that about himself as far as the time he had to do what he had to do and only could do, only one who could do it, to save us from our sins. I must work the works of him that sent me. Why in his day that I come when no man can work? There's an end to opportunity. Always an end to opportunity. And you don't know when it's going to end. He recognizes, since man's an intellectual, rational creature, man's need for evidence. He never asks us to believe in him without adequate evidence, credible witness. He does not do it. And that's why you've got such passages refer referred to so often as John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Well, then why are these written? Now, these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing have life through his name. What does that mean? I've given you the necessary wherewithal to know that I'm the Son of God, to know that I'm the one that can save you, and that salvation is in no other. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He relates to what is best in man and for man. He deals with man individually. Go through and notice how many of the sermons we preach to audiences were originally preached just to one person, involved the conversation. Ah, I've got a sermon coming up on this. Uh, haven't preached it in a while, but this is a good illustration. That's he and Nicodemus. Look how much on the new birth we preach to audiences this size, bigger. That was just him and Nicodemus one night. Socially. He dealt with man as to what's best for him in society. And that certainly takes in marriage and the home. He dealt with what was temporary. There are a lot of things we absolutely need in the flesh, but they're passing. And he'll show you how to relate what's temporary and provisionary for the flesh. Very needful here, but how to not let it get in the way of what's eternal if we'll follow him. And then, of course, he deals with the eternal, that which is abiding. There's not a single false statement or proposition anywhere connected with him. There is not a single unsound argument that Jesus ever offered. He holds before man the greatest challenge to do and to be the very best that it's possible for him to do and to be. And I mentioned this morning in class, what do you expect out of a true, faithful gospel preacher? If it's not to challenge you to be the best you can be, then you need to put your money somewhere else. That's exactly what you need to do. He holds before man, man's only hope. Remembering hope means the expectation of heaven and an earnest desire to possess what we have a right to expect. Looking over this old world's miserable mess, and even beyond our death, to the day of the resurrection and the glories of heaven as described in the Bible. The, let me mention this. Hope allows us to bring the future near us. 
and weed out everything in between it. And I'm sorry for people that don't understand biblical hope or they don't exercise it. Because when everything's down or appears to be and everything's turned wrong side out and the brethren are acting like they don't know even what the gospel is, you still look at heaven. What did we sing about a while ago, Jim? Didn't we sing about heaven? Did you not meditate on what the Bible teaches about heaven? Or is it some sort of Star Wars movie that might be coming back around someday and you'll get to watch it? We're talking about living and existing in a place just like you live and exist in this place, but so different and will be so different. Christ gives to man the only satisfactory standard upon which to make decisions pertaining to life and godliness. Well, I'll tell you again, I'm uh, working on, I've already got them, two sermons on, one's on Romans 12, 1, one sermon, and the second one's on Romans 12, 2, next sermon. I almost preached them today. You say, why didn't you? I didn't want to. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> but there's a lot you can milk out of those ser out of those verses. And so, what does he say concerning the only satisfactory standard upon which to make our decisions of life? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind, which is your reasonable service. Everything we're doing and looking to Jesus, the perfect handwriting at the top of the page, and in our lives trying to think and act and do just like he did in the way he did it, as it's set out in his last one in Testament, is the way that we transform ourselves from the way the world operates. The way that we're still in the flesh, but not of the flesh. The way that we take on a different view from the world and the unregenerated, those yet lost in sin, and those who've gone back into the world in apostasy. It gives to man the meaning of, of all the affairs, the questions, the problems, the sufferings of this life. It's there. You've got to spend a lot of time with it. To find it, it emphasizes the proper, that is the right and the just relationship of man to man. He sums it up in only the way Jesus could do in Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even also unto them. You realize how much we were wiped out in the way of trouble in this world if that one thing was consistently understood and practiced? You're talking about a handwriting flawless at the top of the page and our efforts to transfer it into our lives. Christ upholds everything, everything that is just and right and honorable and pure. Now, a lot of folks out there will talk about just, right, honorable, and pure. But they don't define those things according to the infallible Word of God. They don't look to Jesus to say, what did he think was just, right, honorable, and pure? And so what Christians do in faithful adherence to the Word sometimes seems highly strange to the person who doesn't know the Bible, doesn't know what life's all about when you serve Christ faithfully. And one thing about him, he condemns not most false ways. He condemns every false way. Psalm 119, 104, the great psalmist says, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. He stresses the value of every single solitary human individual on this earth. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have in our own minds, first of all, toward ourselves, the value that God places on us. And then learn to place that value on all of you ugly, unloving, gripey, groany, mean, stupid people. Now, I'm in that boat too, you know. You know, how many times do we say, the nuts? Well, <laughs> Christ died for that nut. Stupid ignoramus. Christ died for that stupid ignoramus. And they may be in a lot of things they do in the way they do. The Bible itself calls people foolish. In fact, he can call them stupid. But he's talking about the way they're living. 
their thoughts, their actions. It's contrary to the Word of God. He's not talking about the value of their soul. He's talking about them making very poor decisions based on the wrong standard. Thus, they have the wrong attitude. That takes nothing away from the value of their soul. But all those, think for a moment, Christ is nailed to that cross. Well, people nailed him to it. He willed himself to be there. They wouldn't have put him there. He willed himself to stay on that cross six hours, no more, no less. You wonder why? Why not six and a half? Why not five? Christ knew exactly how to satisfy his father's justice. And it took six hours. That's exactly why he's on there six hours. That was suffering to the uttermost. He said, you don't take my life from me. I lay it down for you. Thus he went to the cross, and he stayed there six hours nailed to the cross. That has nothing to do with the persecution he went through before he got there, but he's on that cross. He wills himself to be there six hours as soon as the time is up that he has suffered to the uttermost and satisfied his father's sense of justice for your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world. He then said, it is Finished. What's finished? Everything I came to do to save you, save me. The people that nailed him to the cross. You ever notice what they were doing? What little he had, they were casting lots to who got it. Right at the foot of the cross. You ought to study your Bible sometime what was going on at the foot of the cross. They had no concern about who was on that cross dying for them. None whatsoever. They didn't understand the value of their own souls. They didn't know what life was all about. They were interested in material things, like most of us are. And even when they came to his cloak, which was woven with one seam, oh, how important was that for them? Well, they've been dividing it up between the four of them, but now they came to that because it was fully woven with just one, one seam. They, rather than divide it into four, cast lots who got it. They could have deep concern about that piece of off because of what they considered valuable about it. But they didn't care a thing what was happening right up there before them. And the writhing, angry shame of the Son of God on the cross who held him there by his own will to save their souls. That's the handwriting at the top of the page. We need to learn to develop the disposition of mind of the value of every human on this earth. He deals completely, that is, thoroughly with the problem of sin, its guilt, its practice, and all the other tragic consequences that comes to us because man is tainted by sin. I, I, you heard me saying it's not original to me. I don't know for sure where I got it, but it was true. Christ solved the sin problem. That's exactly what he did. He instructs men to take care of themselves, to take care of their minds, to take care of their bodies, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and Mark 6, 31. In his teaching, while recognizing and respecting the need for and the value of material things, I've touched on this earlier, he instructs men to put spiritual things always first in their lives. He instructs men to be considerate, he instructs them to be compassionate. He instructs them to be helpful. He instructs men to be involved in getting the whole gospel to the whole world, which means we must be concerned about those who are not Christians. He is our model in recognizing truth as being objective and absolute in being willing to suffer any pain in order to act in harmony with the truth, in teaching and in practicing love for all men, those who love you, those who do not love you, and those who actually hate you. And emphasizing that one's mission in life is to do God's will, not any man's will, not one's own will, and not any other human being's will, but the Father's will. And teaching us to strive to be flawless or perfect or complete, then we are having to develop the attitude to live above sin. Does it mean that we'll ever reach that stage here? No, but it's always driving us. It's always challenging us. And if it doesn't, we're not going to rise up much above nothing. 
In Hebrews 4, verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all point tempted like as we are. In teaching us by precept and by example, we should be unselfish and we should be humble. The greatest example he gave of that is John 13, 5 through 14, when he washed the disciples' nasty feet. In teaching us to be forgiving, Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, who's he praying for? That same bunch I told you about a while ago that were more concerned about his clothes, what little he had, than what happened to them, and then everybody else who had a hand in putting him on that cross by condemning him. And teaching us by precept and example to be pure in heart, that is in mind and in deed. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount, read through Matthew 5, and you'll notice a number of verses that says you need to have a pure heart. Now, why should we? The pure in heart will see God. That's why. If you don't work on that, you won't see God. And being compassionate, Isaiah 42, 3. Now, if you look at Christ, he could take the hide off of a sinner and rub salt in the wound. But have you ever noticed how he was when they repented? He was just as ready to receive them back to him upon their repentance as he was to give them what they needed to bring them to repentance. Sometimes I think we would like to have a little pound of flesh. It would make us feel better before they repented, of course. In upholding the sanctity of marriage in the home, Matthew 5, 31 and 32, and Matthew 19, 3 through 12, and the great example of the home in Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 4, in helping us to understand the reasons for suffering and dying. He did that. Uh, sorry if you haven't studied it, but it's there. John 3, 16, Matthew 20, 28, Hebrews 2, 9, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 10. On and on you go. Now, I said those, not expecting you to be able to write them down that fast, but to say they're there. Spend some time on saying, what is death all about? Why is it here? What do we do about it? He shows us how to fight the devil and to win. To resist temptation, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And by the way, it always involved his proper knowledge of the Bible and answering the devil in every case. And dealing with persecution and false charges, 1 Peter 2, 22 and 23. You're not going to live the Christian life and not be persecuted. Paul said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall be perse persecuted, suffer persecution. People are going to lie about you. They're going to say things about you. What do you expect? Think about it. For I'm amazed that people say, I want to be godly. And then have all these people do to them what people did to the faithful apostles in Christ. And say, and say oh, I just can't. I don't understand. Well, I don't know what to tell you, but it's been there all along. It's handwriting at the top of the page. And he'll tell you how to live through it and live through it faithful. As the master controversialist, now think about this. The master controversialist. Alexander Campbell, a long time ago, said this about our Lord. It's great. When he was talking about him beginning his ministry, following his baptism by John, he made this statement about Christ. He unsheathed the sword at the Jordan River and threw away the scabbard. That meant he never was going to have a reason to put it up. And everybody that's going to live the Christian life better have on the whole armor of God and I don't find in Ephesians 6 that they have a scabbard for the sword. It's not there. As our perfect example then, he is perfect in character, in teaching, and the model for us in all things pertaining to life and godliness. Now what should this mean for us? With all that we are and all that we have, it means we should strive to be like him. To be careful to live and to teach his teaching faithfully and not deviate from it in any form. To be careful to follow and imitate him. Strive always by life, by word, and by pen to reflect Christ as we put into practice the mind of Christ revealed in the word of Christ in the New Testament of Christ in God's good book. If you're not a child of God, we would humbly beseech you and urge you to Consider the truth of the gospel, that Christ is our Savior, that you believe in Christ with all your heart, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the rest of your sin. And to all my brethren, are you really striving, all that you are, 
to write just like the perfect writing at the top of the page. Peter said, he's left us an example that we should follow in his steps. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come over, stand and sing. <laughs>